Hello everyone! We are down to our last two topics on Module 3 about assessing the curriculum and curriculum innovations. Our talking points will be the criteria for curriculum assessment and characteristics of a good curriculum. After this session, you will be able to create your own criteria on assessing the curriculum based on school experiences. And you will be able to write a reflection about the characteristics of a good curriculum. Let's define first the word criteria. Criteria is a set of standards to be followed in assessment. Specifically, as they apply to curriculum, Criteria are a set of standards upon which the different elements of curriculum are being tested. The criteria will determine the different levels of competencies or proficiency of acceptable task performance. Let's talk about first the criteria for goals and objectives. Goals and objectives are statements of curricular expectations. They are sets of learning outcomes specifically designed for students. The items must reflect the takes, skills, content behavior, and thought processes that make up curricular domains and must also match a student's needs. Goals and instructional objectives are formulated and specified for the following purposes. First, to have focus on curriculum and instruction which give direction to where students need to go. Second, to meet the requirements specified in the policies and standards of curriculum and instruction. Next, to provide students the best possible education and describe the student's level of performance. Next, to monitor the progress of students based on the goals set. And lastly, to motivate students to learn and teachers to be able to feel a sense of competence when goals are attained. For goals and objectives to be formulated, certain criteria elements should be included. According to Howell and Nollett in 2000, we have four criteria namely content, behavior, criterion, and condition. Content, for the objectives, what contents should students learn? Behavior, what will students do to indicate that they have learned? Third, criterion, what level of performance should the students have to master the behavior? And fourth, condition, under what circumstances should students need to work in order to master the behavior? Writing effective goals and objectives should also use the following general criteria. First, we have the syntactic correctness. Are the objectives syntactically correct? Second, compliance with legal requirements. Do the objectives comply with the legal requirements of the course of subjects? Third, the stranger test. Do the objectives pass the stranger test? Next, we have both knowledge and behavior are addressed. Do the objectives address both knowledge and behavior? Then, the so what test. Do they pass the so what test? followed by individualization, are the objectives aligned? And lastly, common sense. Do they make common sense? Here's an example checklist for goals and objectives. Number one, do the goals and or objectives represent an important learning outcome that is a priority for the student? Second, is there a goal written for each area of need stated in the present level of performance? Third, are the goals realistic in the sense that they can be accomplished in one year? Fourth, are the goals and objectives easily measured? 
Fifth, are there multiple objectives representing intermediate steps to each goal? Six, are the goals and instructional objectives appropriately calibrated, sliced neither too broadly nor too narrowly? And seventh, are the goals and instructional objectives useful for planning and evaluating instructional programs? That's for the criteria of goals and objectives. Let's have criteria for assessment of instruction. The word instruction refers to the implementation of the objectives. It is concerned with the methodologies of the strategies of teaching. There are two approaches of instruction. We have the supplantive approach and the generative approach. Supplantive approach, according to Adams and Engelman in 1996, it is referred to as direct instruction. In here, the teacher attempts to promote learning by providing explicit directions and explanations regarding how to do a task. The teacher assumes primary responsibility for linking new information with the student's prior knowledge and ultimately whatever the students learn. With this approach, information is presented in an ordered sequence in which component subskills are taught directly or a foundation for later tasks. This approach is highly teacher-directed. On the other hand, we have the generative approach. It is referred to as constructivist or developmental. In here, the teacher functions as facilitator who takes a less central role in learning process, that is, student-directed. The teacher provides opportunities for the students to make own linkages to prior knowledge and to devise her own strategies for work. Generative approach is constructivist because most of its emphasis is on helping students construct their own educational goals and experiences as well as the knowledge that results. With this approach, information is presented on a schedule determined by students' interests and goals. Now, what are the criteria for curriculum? Again, curriculum are guidelines on standards for curriculum decision making. The objectives of a curriculum or teaching plan are the most important curriculum criteria since they should be used in selecting learning experiences and evaluating learning achievement. The criteria are stated in the form of questions as the following. Have the goals of the curriculum or teaching plan been clearly stated? And are they used by teachers and students in choosing content, materials, activities for learning? Have the teacher and students engaged in student-teacher planning in defining the goals and in determining how they will be implemented? Do some of the planned goals relate to the society or the community in which the curriculum will be implemented or the teaching will be done? Do some of the planned goals relate to the individual learner and his or her needs, purposes, interests, and abilities? Are the planned goals used as criteria in selecting and developing learning materials for instruction? And are the planned goals used in criteria in evaluating learning achievement and in further planning of learning sub-goals and activities? According to Haas and Parquet in 1993, individual differences, flexibility, and systematic planning are criteria that depend in part on knowledge of the different approaches to learning. The criterion questions are the following. Does the curriculum or teaching plan include alternative approaches and alternative activities for learning? Have the different learning theories been considered in planning alternative learning approaches and activities? 
And last question, has the significance of rewarded responses, transfer, generalization, advanced organizers, self-concept, meaningfulness of the whole, personal meaning, imitation, identification, and socialization been considered in planning? Now, those were the questions to be answered in curriculum assessment. This time, let's move on to the characteristics of a good curriculum. What are the characteristics of a good curriculum? First, the curriculum is continuously evolving. It evolved from one period to another to the present. For curriculum to be effective, it must have continuous monitoring and evaluation. Curriculum must adapt its educational activities and services to meet the needs of a modern and dynamic community. Second, the curriculum is based on the needs of the people. A good curriculum reflects to the needs of the individual and the society as a whole. The curriculum is in proper shape in order to meet the challenges of times and make education more responsive to the clientele it serves. Third, the curriculum is democratically conceived. A good curriculum is developed through the efforts of a group of individuals from different sectors in the society who are knowledgeable about the interest, needs, and resources of the learner and the society as a whole. The curriculum is the product of many minds and energies. Fourth characteristic, the curriculum is the result of a long-term effort. A good curriculum is a product of long and tedious process. It takes a long period of time in planning, management, evaluation, and development of a good curriculum. Fifth, the curriculum is a complex of details. A good curriculum provides the proper instructional equipment and meeting places that are often most conducive to learning. It includes the student-teacher relationship, guidance and counseling program, health services, school and community projects, library and laboratories, and other school-related work experiences. Number six characteristic is the curriculum provides for the logical sequence of subject matter. Learning is developmental. Classes and activities should be planned. A good curriculum provides continuity of experiences. Seventh, the curriculum complements and cooperates with other programs of the community. The curriculum is responsive to the needs of the community. The school offers its assistance in the improvement and realization of ongoing programs of the community. There is cooperative effort between the school and the community towards greater productivity. Eight, the curriculum has educational quality. Quality education comes through the situation of the individual's intellect and creative capacities for social welfare and development. The curriculum helps the learner to become the best that he can possibly be. The curriculum support system is secured to augment existing sources for its efficient and effective implementation. And lastly, the curriculum has administrative flexibility. A good curriculum must be ready to incorporate changes whenever necessary. The curriculum is open to revision and development to meet the demands of globalization and digital age. That's it for the characteristics of good curriculum. Again, the characteristics of a good curriculum are First, the curriculum is continuously evolving. Second, the curriculum is based on the needs of the people. Third, the curriculum is democratically conceived. Fourth, the curriculum is the result of a long-term effort. Fifth, the curriculum is a complex of details. Sixth, the curriculum provides for the logical sequence of subject matter. 
Seventh, the curriculum complements and cooperates with other programs of the community. Eight, the curriculum has educational quality. And lastly, the curriculum has administrative flexibility. That's it. Congratulations, everyone, for finishing Module 3. Are you learning? I hope you are. Again, congratulations everyone for finishing the last module for our subject, Curriculum Development. If you have questions, post those in our Google Classroom. Also, check out your activities and tasks in our Google Classroom. That's it. See you in our synchronous session. This has been Ms. Pretzel and Red. Thank you for listening and stay safe. When the sun goes down